quite a audience built up. So hello guys and welcome back to virtual shadowing. Thank you um, so much for being here today and I just want to welcome everyone that's new since we had a lot of new people join today. Um, so before we get started, this is Nick. He's um, a radiologist, uh, radiology resident, and he'll be talking about himself. But before we go ahead and do that, um, I'll just go through the guidelines, talk about summaries and everything like that. So let's get started. And oh, if you guys have any questions along the way, just um, ask me in the chat and I'll um, go through it if I don't already go through it. All right. Let's see, I hope you guys can see my screen. All right, so first things first are the guidelines. So a lot of you guys have questions with the guidelines. Um, uh, where'd it go? Okay, so um, in order to verify that you guys actually attended this shadowing session, you need to write a summary of um, the call. So it can be anything from like what you learned, from what he talked about, like beginning to end, we require like something that covers the entire call to like, you know, make sure you guys like listen to all of it. And then once you, sorry, once you have your summary, send it to clubmedshu at gmail.com. And once you guys send it in, um, we will verify it. And you have to give us a few weeks for that. Cause remember we get thousands of emails um, a week and we all do this manually. So give it a few weeks for us to process it and to verify your summary. And once we get it verified, we will email you the certificate. So it's as simple as that. You don't really have to register or anything. Um, so that's like really nice that you don't have to um, go through like a huge hassle. So um, let me hop on real quick. Um, all right, so now that we covered that, we um, let's go to YouTube. So you guys are probably gonna see yourselves real quick. Real quick. So um, we asked that you guys, if you guys don't want to um, subs like not, if you guys don't wanna sign up for the email reminders, which you guys can do in the link in our bio on Instagram. If you go sign up for that, you can, um, check you can get a email every week that tells you what the call of the week is and what the, what time it's at but if you don't want to do that or in addition to doing that just in case like so you don't miss it you can subscribe to our youtube channel and once you do that it'll probably it notifies you every time we go live so like you literally cannot miss it now that we covered that sorry i'm taking up so much time and just like covering everything but um we encourage you guys to make a LinkedIn and if you don't, um, if you already have one to go connect with us on LinkedIn, because if you do that, your employers, your schools can see that um, you've been shadowing and volunteering there. So like, here's my profile, just for an example. And you can see that like, hey, like I volunteer here and I'm a virtual shadow shadower here and it can like um, amplify your LinkedIn. So you guys look like, you know, no, not look like you guys are getting experience. So that's all really cool stuff. And without further ado, I'm so sorry for taking up so much time already, but um, let me just end the, hold on. Stop share. There we go. Um, again, we have Dr. Nick here today, um, our radiologist resident, and I will let him take it from here. Well, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Yep. It says host disabled. Oh no. Uh, screen sharing. There, try now. Okay. Okay. How's this look? Perfect. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, really pumped to talk with you guys today but I'm gonna basically go over a little bit about myself, a little bit about my pre-med and medical school experience, and then mostly about kind of residency and how I ended up in radiology. And then we'll go over some clinical cases at the end, talk a little bit about artificial intelligence, if anyone is interested in that. Um, look at some images, of course, and then kind of wrap things up. So let me know how I'm doing on time and um, or if I should speed up or slow down, or oh, if you guys have questions, please um, feel free to interrupt. So, 
about me. So I thought a map would probably be the easiest way to explain where I'm from. So I'm from a small city outside of Sacramento called Lodi, which is closer to a bigger city called Stockton. Um, I went to college at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, so that's a little bit south from San Francisco here. Um, I took two gap years, which are becoming increasingly common. I worked for a startup called Augmetics in San Francisco. And Augmetics focused on doing remote medical documentation for physicians using Google Glass. So it was a really good opportunity for me to get exposure to different medical specialties. Um, I got a lot of exposure to orthopedic surgery, um, family medicine especially, um, a little bit of integrative medicine and rheumatology. So it was great for that. Um, and then I applied to uh, medical school and went to med school for my first and second year in Bradenton, Florida, which is close to Tampa. Um, and then for third and fourth year, my medical school had an affiliation with a network of physicians in San Diego. So I did my last two years, third and fourth year clinical rotations in San Diego. So that's kind of um, my medical education. And then now I'm in Minneapolis or in Minnesota at the university um, doing my intern year. And then in June, I'll be starting diagnostic radiology residency full time. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I have a lot of hobbies. One of them is Instagramming lately, um, mostly talking about information about COVID. Um, I'm also uh, into like fitness and I played rugby in college. Um, I was a wrestler in high school, so I tried to uh, stay limber. Um, and I also play traditional Greek folk music. So um, I'll probably post a little bit about that, like the instruments that I play uh, and the type of um, like, like parties and events that um, that I perform at. Um, so that's a really big passion of mine. So music is definitely um, a huge hobby. So kind of music, sports, and I guess social media now. <laughs> that's um, cool. That's really cool, the music. I'm excited. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people are surprised to, um, it's just a very uh, unique or different instrument. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so I think even before, like if you're pre-health or pre-med, you just need to ask yourself, why am I doing this? Or what are my reasons for wanting to become a physician? Because there are many careers in healthcare. And even I'm learning about some of them now as a medical student, as a resident, right? So I think it's really important to gain clinical experience in the hospital and figure out why do you want to specifically be a physician? So I looked at many other um, careers, you know, physical therapy, dental school, um, PA school, you know, um, I entertained the thought of many other careers, you know, even grad school um, to get a PhD. But I ultimately um, saw myself like, I really wanted that like clinical expertise, right? I wanted to be like the go-to person for a certain problem. I want, I want the patients to trust me. I want it to be like that person that, you know, you go to and like, you know, that's your doctor, like this person's gonna help me through whatever's going on. Um, then I also was really um, passionate about like science and the intellectual curiosity of like how the human body works and all of these upper division um, courses that I took in undergrad, like endocrinology, micro, uh, physiology, anatomy, uh, molecular and cell biology. So, I mean, for me, it was, it was like, okay, I'm really loving this content and um, I know that I'm gonna really enjoy medical school. And uh, mm -hmm. overall, I'd say I did. So, you know, people have asked me, would you do it? Would you do it again? Or would you recommend it? And it's like, well, I, I would recommend it if you want to be a physician, but it's so much work that if you don't, or if you don't know, uh, maybe consider something else. <laughs> I'm sure other physicians say something similar along those lines, but um, I think med school is great. Um, so a couple tips for the MCAT. So I took the MCAT twice. That's pretty normal, I think. Um, I think when I took it, it was the old MCAT. So I can't really give advice as to what's going on now. I actually took the MCAT right before, it was like the last day that you could take the old MCAT in like January of 2015 or something. Mm -hmm. So um, 
I think the number one resource to use for the MCAT, and I'll talk about this later, is USMLE World. And they have a QBank for the NCLEX, for all of the USMLEs, and, um, and also for the MCAT. And I mean, for the USMLE, I mean, UWorld is amazing. It's truly amazing. Um, and I think if you pair that with a tool called Anki or Anki, A-N-K-I, um, a lot of you may have heard that, uh, of that uh, free software. Um, and some of you haven't, but it's just, I think that's the best way to do it. So, you know, talk to, talk to people who, who have scored where you want to score. You know, I'm probably not the best person for that. Um, if you want like the best score, you know, go find that person that in your, in your circle of friends who, who did the best, um, and see what they did, pick their brain and then take that and adopt it for yourself. And, you know, you might have to take it a second or third time and that's, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so I applied to 30 schools, 15 were MD and 15 were DO. And so the MD application is through the AAMC. The DO apps are through the ACOM. Um, mm -hmm. I actually found ACOM to have a better uh, user interface when I applied. Um, I got eight interviews, all of which were at DO schools, funny enough. And I got two acceptances. So one of which was at LECOM. And so this is where it gets a little confusing because I went to Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine, but they have two campuses, the main of which is in Erie, Pennsylvania. And then they have another campus in Florida, in Bradenton. Mm -hmm. So I went to the Florida campus. Um, and I chose that school for um, many reasons, but um, I think what, what you should look for in a med school is first and foremost, like how are these students faring in regards to the national average? for uh, board scores. So how are these students doing on Comlex and USMLE? And then how are they doing as far as the match? You know, what's the match rate are like close to 100% of these students matching? Um, and then where are they matching? Are they matching geographically where you, where you would like to be in four years? Are you willing to be elsewhere or move out of state like I did um, for four years or even longer? Um, you know, my residency is six years, so that's 10 years away from home, which is California for me. Um, so it's like, how bad do you want it as a part of it too, right? Uh, and then another uh, factor I think is uh, tuition. So how much does the school cost? Because I don't think the value of going to a more expensive school, um, I don't think it's paid back proportionally. So you could, you could go to the cheapest medical school and we're all using the same books more or less. We're all taking USMLE. It's the same information, more or less. If anything, it's just prestige and pedigree and connections that could maybe help you, you know? So um, just keep cost in mind because uh, we all know student loans are a separate issue. Mm -hmm. I think a quarter of medical students are fortunate enough not to have to really worry about them. Um, not that I'm necessarily worrying about them, but it's just another thing. It's like another thing on your to-do list, right? Right, it's just another factor. Um, actually, before you um, move on with LECOM, um, I don't know, for this is for my high school viewers out there or my freshmen and sophomores um, in college, LECOM actually has a combined BSO, BSDO program now. And so basically with that, you can apply for early admission um, your senior year of high school or your freshman and sophomore year of college. And basically what it does is it saves your spot in med school as long as you go to their affiliate undergrad college. So that's something that you guys should keep your eye out. So that's super cool. Um, with that, you guys don't have to take the MCAT. You don't have to worry about um, sending in um, applications or anything like that. So if you guys are interested, sorry for interrupting. No, that's a great tidbit. Um, yeah, LECOM, there, there were about, I mean, I think I probably knew at least three people who were in that BSDO program, which is pretty nice. You don't have to take the MCAT. Mm -hmm. um, there's also um, a really tight linkage with the master's program. So some of you who've already graduated, uh, you can do uh, the master's of science, I think in biomedical sciences. It's kind of like the first year of medical school. And LECOM is not the only school to offer this. Um, uh, but you could do that, and then it significantly increases your chances of getting into LECOM's medical school and other medical schools, but I don't think it improves your chances at other medical schools as much. Um, so just keep that in mind, because it's, another, it's basically another year of education. 
Um, I can't see the chat, so let me know if there's questions that, that pop up that are worth addressing, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so first year was pretty rough for me. Um, I had just done a lot of traveling and uh, we started with anatomy and didn't do that great on my first exam, but you know, I kind of ramped up my studying, I fine tuned it, I figured out what worked, what didn't work, and then I you know, improved through that, that first semester. So don't worry if you start off on the wrong foot, that's okay. Um, and LECOM Bradenton specifically, um, we have a 100% uh, PBL or problem-based learning curriculum which at first I was a little apprehensive of, of when I like interviewed there. And then I thought about it. I was like, oh, this stuff, you know, this seems kind of weird. It seems like a lot of work. But once I thought about it, I was like, oh, well, these students are scoring really well on boards. Clearly it's working. Um, and I mean, PBL, I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, I'll probably do another, I'll probably do an Instagram post on this fairly soon. Um, but basically you are not like going to lectures. You're like, doing independent study and you have like maybe 10 to 15 hours of actually going to campus and being in like a classroom, you know, but it's kind of like a flipped classroom where you have to figure out like how, how to learn, which is kind of how residency is and how being an attending will be. So um, it kind of like sets you up for that. I thought it was great. Yeah. Second year, you know, you have to hunker down for USMLE step one. I would definitely recommend it if you're a DO student, you know, just take it, just use UWorld and study for step one, and then study the OMM and take Comlex after that, you know, just keep it simple. Um, it's just like, to be the most competitive and to be, uh, you know, the most favorable in the eyes of program directors when they're reviewing your application, you know, you got to take uh, USMLE because it will just make you a more attractive medical student, um, not only for getting interviews for residency, but also for doing away rotation. So some uh, elective or away rotation rotations or auditions, they will require a minimum step score. So keep that in mind. Or, or they'll require that you actually took step and they won't accept comics, for example. And that's just like an institution thing. Um, third year, so I moved to San Diego for, um, uh, for rotations. You know, you do internal medicine, surgery, uh, pediatrics, family medicine, OBGYN, psychiatry, and then you have some elective. So I did an elective in dermatology and um, diagnostic radiology. Um, I did no way rotation in interventional radiology and several other um, radiology um, rotations. Um, so I kind of got a good, um, I think a good experience as far as like the different types of ways to practice radiology. Um, and I also did uh, two months of emergency medicine. So, and then COVID hit and kind of, squashed everything. But basically at the end of most of these rotations, you will have a shelf exam. It's basically like a subject exam. It's like a two hour exam. Um, so you got to study all month for it. Um, you know, just got to pass them there. They can be, they can be annoying. I'll just say that much. Um, but oh, yeah. <laughs> don't blow them off <laughs> because the shelf exam information is what's going to rear its ugly head on step two. And step two is, is, I wouldn't say it's easier than step one, but because you've already conquered a lot of material, it's not new to you anymore. Step two becomes a little easier in that aspect. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of information, you're still gonna use UWorld. I did the same thing, studied for step two, then studied OMM and took Comlex. Um, and I'll probably do a post on the differences between Comlex and USMLE at some point. Um, and if you're interested in the differences between the two, definitely send me a message so uh, kind of um, comes to mind and I do it faster. Um, then, you know, fourth year came and I matched in, uh, I think it's mid-March. Um, super happy to have matched here. This is definitely, you know, the strongest, you know, if not one of the strongest programs that I interviewed at. I'm very fortunate to be here. Um, I'm basically spending my intern year um, at Hennepin County Medical Center and then years PGY2, post-grad year two through five at the university. So um, I'll talk a little bit about that here. Um, so radiology is one of the, what's called advanced specialties, and that's in comparison to categorical. So advanced means that it does not include PGY1 or intern year. Um, categorical means that it does. So I basically had to apply to two types of residencies when I applied. So the types that I, that you can apply to are, are transitional year 
internal medicine or general surgery. So for that entire first year, you're not really doing what you intended to do in your advanced specialty. That could be dermatology, physiatry, um, radiation oncology, anesthesia, ophthalmology. All of these specialties require that you do um, an intern year that's separate. So it kind of teaches you how to be a general doctor or you know you kind of just learn how to doctor. And I think that's the point of it is so that when you go into your specialty, you can kind of understand where your other clinician colleagues are coming from, you know, whether those are surgeons or primary care doctors. So I am currently in a transitional year. Um, there are differences between these three. I think the main difference is that the TY year is more, has more variety. Um, internal medicine is mostly internal medicine and med medical electives like cardiology or gastroenterology. And general surgery, those ones are um, notoriously the most uh, demanding as far as hours. Mm -hmm. So just keep that in mind. Like I didn't even apply to any general surgery ones. Um, then diagnostic radiology residency is four years after that. So we have one plus four, that's five years total. So diagnostic radiology residency is R1 through R4 is how they're referred to. But as an R1, you're really PGY2. So the terminology gets a little funny there. Um, and then you apply for fellowship. And radiology has a lot of different fellowships that you can do. Um, there's musculoskeletal, so muscles, bones, tendons, ligaments, sports medicine, orthopedic stuff, um, you know, trauma, um, musculoskeletal tumors, oncology. Um, there's neuroimaging. Uh, you know, you might talk to a lot more neurologists or neurosurgeons in that specialty. Um, there's abdominal or body imaging. There's mammography or breast imaging. Uh, a lot of public health and women's health uh, aspects to that specialty. Uh, pediatrics, of course, nuclear medicine, interventional radiology, and neurointerventional radiology. So these specialties are a little different from, from the rest of these kind of more diagnostic specialties. Mm -hmm. um, but we do, you know, IR is notorious for doing a lot of procedures, and they're basically doing procedures all day long. Um, but a lot of these other specialties do uh, procedures as well. They're just maybe not as like heavy duty. So yeah, total, most likely six years. If you do neuro IR, you might be at seven years total. Um, there's many pathways to get to IR, so it could, it could also take you seven years, but of, of the three pathways to get to IR, two of them take six years and one takes seven. So it's a long road, you know, total. I mean, you have four years high school, four years college, four years medical school, and then you have six years radiology, right? Mm -hmm. So we're talking 14 years after age 18. Um, <laughs> it's insane. It's a lot, you know, but we have to know a lot. And um, I think for good reason, it's, it's long. Uh, before you go more into radiology, there were a couple questions that um, some people had about your undergrad years. So like before we move on too far, um, some people, there were a lot of questions um, asking about your gap years, like, why did you take your two gap years and what did you do during them? And, you know, just like maybe talk a little bit more about um, the benefits. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I work for this company. It's called Augmetics. I'm pretty sure they're still around. Made a lot of friends there. Um, so why did I take it? I took it because I took the MCAT after I graduated college. Mm -hmm. So um, I just needed the time to kind of figure out how, what resources I was going to use and kind of get my personal statement tuned up, get my letters of recommendation in line, figure out, you know, which schools I wanted to apply to, you know, I was working, so I was able to pay for, you know, I mean, I probably spent like almost 10 grand on this application process. You know, I didn't want to put that on my parents at the time. Um, so those are some of the reasons. Um, I also lived in San Francisco for a little bit. So that was really great. Um, it's funny how I got the job, actually. I wasn't even looking for the for a job. I, I was on, um, I think I was on LinkedIn. So I think you were talking about the power of LinkedIn earlier, but I had been a scribe for maybe four months before I like took time off to study for the MCAT. And then by the time I finished the MCAT, uh, I got a message from this company saying that, hey, we're recruiting. We see that you're a scribe. And in this position, I uh, was in a position where um, like at Augmetics, I was like helping 
medical documentation that was happening remotely with physicians wearing the Google Glass unit. So basically they would go see a patient and then because there's a camera and a microphone um, on the unit, it would get sent through the Wi-Fi, the audio and the video, and then a scribe could tune into the live stream, you know, so like, for example, I could like virtually shadow kind of how like, like you guys are doing now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was like HIPAA compliant and everything. So you got to see, you know, not only patient care, uh, management, bedside manner, you know, uh, what are these physicians, uh, you know, um, what's their workflow, how much time in, in the day, like when are they taking their breaks, who are they interacting with, the MAs, the nurses, you know, um, what are they having for lunch? You know, it's just like, you know, um, life stuff. So it was a great opportunity. Um, definitely, you know, a lot of people take one year off. A lot of people take five or 10 years off. So there's classmates that I, you know, I was 24 when I started med school. There's other people who are 30 and 35. So I don't think there's, um, I think there's a lot of maturity that and growing uh, that happens then. Other right. questions on gap year? Um, I think you should be set. Cool. Okay, we talked about residency. Yeah, like some of this stuff, like residency is not like immediately pertinent to pre-med necessarily, but um, I am excited to talk about radiology now. Um, so I'm gonna split this up into medical aspects that uh, radiology has and then you know non-medical aspects of it. So we are basically like the eyes of medicine. So if you come to the emergency department, your belly hurts, emergency doctor is going to check you out. We're going to get vitals, right? You're going to do a physical exam, talk to you, see what's going on, get a history. And that doctor is going to write a soap note, which has subjective, objective, and then assessment and plan. So in the assessment and plan part, you know, that doctor might think, okay, we can get an x-ray of this person's abdomen. We can get some sort of ultrasound of, the gallbladder, the liver, the kidneys, uh, the pancreas, the abdomen, you know, depending on the age of the patient, um, or we may get a CT scan. So this, this is where kind of radiology fits into patient care. It's all about imaging. Um, it's all about patient care and management and helping the clinician on the other side. So not only do we, um, do, you know, focus on reading images, you know, that could be an X-ray ultrasound, CT scan, MRI, it could be a nuclear study, a PET scan. Um, we do a lot of procedures too. And usually the, they are image guided. So we might use an ultrasound probe to see exactly where we're going in order to drain some fluid in a cirrhotic patient. We may um, do a thoracentesis or a paracentesis. Um, we do a lot of biopsies. It could be a breast biopsy, could be a thyroid biopsy, um, liver biopsy, you know, we treat Interventional radiology treats cancers using chemoembolization. Um, there's radio embolization. Uh, there's cryoablation for renal cell carcinoma, kidney cancer. Um, so many procedures. I mean, I could go on all day, but it's just a fantastic, fantastic specialty because you're really focusing on pathology. You're focusing on disease and like helping people. Um, so I think it's I think it's wonderful, um, and the impact you can make is is I wouldn't say infinitely larger than maybe a surgeon or a primary care doctor, but you know, as a surgeon, let's say you do five surgeries in a day. In the primary care clinic, you may see 20 or 30 patients in a day, right? Well, well um, we can see, you know, see anywhere from, let's say 20 or 30 CT scans that come through, which take a lot of time, or an MRI would take a lot of time to read, um, or we can see up to 100 or 200 uh, scans. And so that could be a mix of ultrasound and x-rays that come in. So you may read 50 one day or 200 and another day. It just depends on what radiology rotation that you're on and kind of how, how your uh, practice is structured. Um, we also do what's called protocoling. Um, so let's say you're the emergency doctor um, and you order a CT scan. Then I might be the resident on the other end uh, kind of figuring out, okay, is this scan the right test for the patient's problem, right? So if the patient has like right upper quadrant pain after a fatty meal, could be gallstones, super common. And maybe, you know, it's a 
a lower level resident who, I mean, a resident would know this, but you know, they order the CT scan, then you're like, no, actually we should get an ultrasound because there's no radiation. So that would be one example. Um, another example might have to do with contrast. So, you know, depending on what you're looking for, let's say you're looking for like active hemorrhage, like gastrointestinal hemorrhage in a patient um, that may or may not warrant contrast. So if you're the clinician, you order a study without contrast and we think that you need contrast or like it would help us to identify what you're looking for, then um, we'd let you know to kind of change the order. That makes sense. And then of course, radiation safety is big. So when we do a lot of these procedures, maybe it's a joint injection in the shoulder where we put a little bit of steroids in there. Um, we can do joint injections in the knee or in the hip uh, or in the foot. Um, we're using what's called fluoroscopy. So it's kind of this monitor that has continuous x-ray. So we're basically radiating that place and then looking at the anatomy in real time. So we know exactly where that needle is going. So it's not going in blind. Um, and interventional radiology uh, uses basically fluoroscopy all day long. So um, whenever we're doing a fluoroscopic procedure, um, we're wearing lead suits. So kind of drapes like a skirt and then it kind of hangs up here. Um, and then we also have thyroid shields and um, most of us will wear some sort of eye protection with glasses that have like lead in them. And then some people will also wear like a scrub cup that has like a lining of lead here just to protect your brain. Um, then of course there's physics. So in our boards, we have a component of physics on there. I don't think it's anything to be scared about. It's nothing like the physics that you took in college. Um, but I can't say I understand physics that well, but you, you know, you're given resources to educate yourself or to get educated on, you know, via didactics, lectures, attendings, talking to you about it, um, online videos, books, just like you study in undergrad, right? So you, you end up learning it. Um, so that's a milestone for me to cross later. Um, so some non-medical aspects. So I talked about how we might read up to 200 scans per shift, so it can get pretty busy. Um, the hours vary. So typical hours are like 7.30 to 4.30. That depends if you're taking night call, it depends if you're doing, um, you know, you might be working five to 11 and then person who's working overnight is taking over for you. So they may be working 11 to eight in the morning or they may be doing a 12 hour shift. So it just depends on like how your institution does call and how as an attending you have your practice structure. So really you're working anywhere from 45 to 50 hours a week. Um, but if you compare that to other specialties, um, it's quite manageable. So I think if you work 50 hours a week, um, that, that was a that was an aspect that really uh, spoke to me because I could like still study outside of clinical work and then I could also like have time with my family and like my hobbies. So something to keep in mind is kind of like that lifestyle component of whatever specialty you end up uh, picking. Um, another aspect is of course vacation. So I've always wondered like how does anyone figure out like, like as an attending, how much time off am I gonna get? Um, I guess emergency doctors might know this because they know that they're gonna work 15 shifts in a month and then that's 15 days off, right? Um, who else might know this? Um, I think a lot of internists or hospitalists might know how much time off that they'll have um, because they'll work like one or two weeks at a time and then they'll have one or two weeks off. So you might only be working half the year, but the, the times that you're on as a hospitalist, you might be working 80 or hundred hours a week. You're just on. Um, so I kind of thought about like, what do I want my day to day to look like? And how much vacation time is going to be enough. So radiology is thankfully one of the more generous ones at the lower end. I'd say attendings get like six to eight weeks of vacation a year. And it can go up to like 12 or 16. So if you're, if you have a really sweet setup, you could have like a lot of time off, like months off. Um, so something else to keep in mind there. Um, and then you could choose to, you know, if that's too much time off for you, great, just pick up a second job or another hobby or <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, many upsides to, 
to the vac vacation time. And of course, vacation time depends on if you're in private practice, if you're in the community, if you're in a rural setting, or if you're at a university academic center, you know, you're doing research, you're meeting with med students, mentoring, teaching, giving lectures. It's very different. I think academics pays less. Private practice tends to pay more. Private practice, you may have to work more, um, but I mean, like be more productive, like clinically, like read more studies, and you might not be doing as much teaching and mentorship and research, for example. So there, there are differences. Um, in academics, you might have six weeks off and you might have one academic day each week. So that academic day is meant for all those things that I just talked about, um, but it's very, very flexible. So you can, you can almost use that as like a freebie day to do um, as you please, you know, answer your email. I don't know what an attending would do. <laughs> it sounds pretty nice to me, right? Uh, in private practice, you, you wouldn't have that academic day, like that one day off a week. Um, of course, rural versus urban, you know, if you want to work in a metropolitan area, um, like a city, you, you have to have to do a fellowship in radiology. So um, that's why earlier I mentioned it takes, you know, six years at least. Everyone over 90, you know, 95% of uh, residents do a fellowship. And if you, if you want to work, you know, um, let's say South Dakota, um, somewhere where it's not very populated, but there's still a big demand. Uh, for someone to be there, uh, you might not have to do fellowship. So just depends on what you want out of life. Should I stop for questions or? No, you're good. Great. You're great. Sounds good. So there are a lot of reasons why I chose radiology. And if you're still paying attention, um, thank you. Um, so I talked about the impact on patient care. Um, that was big for, for me, kind of from an intellectual, rational um, standpoint. I just felt like in, in um, there's a lot of uh, kind of scut work and paperwork that and um, in complex dis discharge situations for patients that uh, took a lot of time. And so, you know, we're really focused on kind of getting things done and the science or the anatomy or the pathology of what's going on. So I thought I felt like the impact was really big. Um, some of the rarest diagnoses need imaging and some of the sickest patients in the hospital need imaging. So um, something that's interesting to a doctor may not be good for the patient, but we see some very interesting cases and those cases come through and then we can present them at lectures and didactic conferences and teach and have like, you know, teaching files. And I don't know, I, I really like that um, aspect of it. Um, and on that same note, the breadth of pathology is huge. One day we could be talking to the emergency doctor, the next day it could be the oncologist, the next day it could be, you know, or in the same day it could be the gastroenterologist, you know, so many specialists come through, surgeons. Um, it's just, I think it's wonderful, um, kind of adds to the variety. Uh, medically, it's very interesting, like I spoke about, it's very high tech, uh, cutting edge, a lot of physics, like I said, uh, we're using really expensive machines. Um, a lot of people talk about like, tools or like having cool tools. Um, we have really cool tools. Uh, so MRI machines, CT scanners are very expensive. Um, just the other day in our reading room, there were, there's basically four monitors that you look at. Some people have like a five monitor setup, others have three monitors. Two of the monitors were being replaced by a single monitor that was the same size. And I asked the IT guy, like how much did it cost? said 16 grand for one monitor, <laughs> kind of amazing. Um, and then I asked him, what's the resolution? I was like, is this like 8K? And he's like, no, it has, I think he said it had, there's like two 3K screens in it. So 6K total is what he said. Um, I mean, it's just crazy that we get to go to work every day at these like badass workstations, right? It's just, it's just great. Um, and, only a radiologist can like justify getting a really expensive mouse, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so like I said earlier, there's a big emphasis on teaching, right? You might have an interesting case, collect that image and present it at a conference later. Um, even in the reading room when you're, you know, I learn so much from attendings every day and there's still so much to, to know because uh, there's just a lot of self-studying that has to happen outside of your rotation. Um, and there's a big emphasis on research. So I subscribe to a lot of radiology research digests and newsletters, and it's just really cool to keep up to date with what's going on. 
And we do have to study a lot. I think I saw a, um, a saying, I don't know how accurate it, it is since I'm not like full on radiology resident quite yet, but they say the, the good radiology resident reads one hour a day, the bad one reads zero hours a day, and an excellent one reads two hours a day. So I don't know, <laughs> studying never ends. Um, some people refer to radiologists as the doctor's doctor. And um, it's not to put other doctors down, but it's like when the clinician has a question about, an, about a certain finding on the imaging, then they'll just call us or they'll come into the room and then we'll talk about it. We'll pull it up. We'll look up the patient's MRN, medical record number, and see what, what's going on and see if we can like help them make a decision clinically. Because mm -hmm. not everything we see in the image is clinically relevant. So like in that way, you're kind of helping every specialty out with your, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's very uh, collaborative and collegial and kind of like you're a consultant. So mm -hmm. really liked being like a generalist and learning about everything. But at the same time, you're also like doing a very niche like task and like it, it's a specialist it's like a generalist yet specialist specialty is the best way I can describe it, which is mm -hmm. sounds so confusing. Um, and it's a very cerebral workflow. So it's a lot of thinking. And in med school, you'll kind of figure out like, you know, do I want to operate and use my hands a lot? Or do I want to be more cerebral and more of a thinker, um, like doer versus thinker? Or do I want a mix of both? You can do, there's plenty of specialties that offer both. Um, radiology offers both, um, and more specifically, like the diagnostic aspects of it is like mostly cerebral, mostly thinking rather than doing. Um, although I don't mind doing like procedures, but if I have to be on my feet for very long, uh, you know, periods of time, then I kind of, you know, kind of want to sh shift towards like reading room and do more diagnostic work. Um, but, you know, getting up, you know, it kind of breaks up the day and getting up for minor procedures throughout the day, like a steroid injection or an arthrogram or a thyroid biopsy, for example. Um, and the personalities in the specialty, some people pin us for like introverts, but I mean, I think I'm fairly extroverted, not super extroverted, um, but you know, the personalities are very heterogeneous. You can't, you know, there's, people have so many different hobbies. Um, Everyone's generally just so nice and, and chill and relaxed. I mean, um, you know, the emergency department's great, but you know, there's, there's people vomiting in the hallway. It's just, it's a very noisy place, right? So for me, um, you kind of have to do some introspection as to what specialty you wanna go towards. But for me, that was a bit much. Um, and I just wanted a more kind of relaxed workflow, so. All right, so five more reasons. So I'm giving you guys 10 total. So a little bit, you know, there's not that much paperwork. You know, a technologist might come to you and ask you to sign some things. You know, there's not complex social work or discharge situations. And there's not a lot of, you know, calls to the pharmacy or, you know, bickering with insurance companies or getting pre-authorization forms, um, you know, sent or anything like that, so. Basically all of our work is like in the computer, which is great. Um, and shift work. So when you're on, you're on, but when you're off, you're off. So you don't have to worry about like, I mean, unless you're on call, let's say you're in interventional radiology, you may have a pager and they may page you in the middle of the night. You might have to go into the hospital, but the diagnostic specialties are, are um, shift work. So you, know, you don't have to really worry about that. Which in my eyes is a positive aspect. Um, as you can tell, it's a, basically as close as you can get to a desk job. Um, you know, you're using huge, uh, not a huge, but a, a large workstation with a lot of computer monitors. It's just, it's basically a computer uh, setup that, you know, you have a phone right there, you can pick up the phone. Um, and because of this reason, you can also work remotely as a teleradiologist. And some practices kind of capitalize on this How do I, how do I do that? <laughs> the chat button on the bottom. Oh, whoops. The chat button in the bottom. 
it's on the bottom of your screen, like the Zoom screen. There we go. No, you're good. Just, you're good. You're good. You're good. Sorry about that, guys. No worries. Um, okay. Yeah, so I talked a little bit about work-life work, work -life balance earlier. Um, and and you, you can work remotely. Um, okay, so moving on. So here are some resources for you guys to kind of dive deeper. Um, some blogs, podcasts, books, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok resources. So Here's some kind of radiology, radiologists and residents and attendings here. You get a lot of good information here. So shout out to all of them. Um, this hopefully will serve you uh, later um, when you're a medical student. So board scores are very important to match. If you're a DO student, definitely consider taking the USMLE. Mm -hmm. um, definitely when you're on your rotations, get strong letters of recommendation. I think that's really important. So that way you're really strong clinically and then diagnostically you uh, can excel and um, you know research can definitely help your application it's not like the end all be all but it's kind of like ice cream everyone likes ice cream and everyone likes research well <laughs> you get what I'm saying yeah. um, if you're interested definitely do an elective and see if it piques your interest if you could see yourself doing this job um, and then do an away rotation as a fourth year medical student um, it's hard to be engaged as a um, or to like look good as a medical student. So look on my Instagram for some tips about how to do that. Mm -hmm. And because radiology, I'd say it's moderately competitive. So the match rate is still 98%. So most people get there, um, most people end up matching into radiology, but because of the higher, but one standard deviation higher uh, USMLE score, it is a little bit more competitive, but it's not like you can't match radiology, you know? Yeah. Um, I know a lot of people are discouraged from doing that, but. Definitely just apply broadly. Definitely apply to the Midwest and to the Northeast, and you'll be surprised at what you find, I think. Um, tips to get into med, med school. So, um, you know, do as good as you can on the MCAT. Talked about UWorld a little bit earlier. Use Anki, you know, this uses the psychological principles of spaced repetition and forced recall. They're very powerful. You know, uh, do some reading on that. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think you'll be surprised at how much, how much knowledge you can truly uh, retain. Um, you know, your GPA is important. Um, so do your best, you know, as long as you put your best foot forward, I think that's the most important thing. Again, in undergrad, if you can do some research, that's great. Um, if it leads to publication, that's wonderful. And then extracurriculars, you know, you want to check off all the boxes, you know, to make sure that you look like a human, like you want to <laughs> volunteer work do some leadership experience, right? Um, some community service, something like that. And of course, clinical experience like shadowing. Just our little flex. We have volunteering as well. So if you guys are interested, check out the link in our bio. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, like what you guys are doing right now is like perfect. Um, letters of recommendation, make sure this person knows you and make sure they know you well. And when you ask for it, don't just ask, can you write me a letter? Ask them, can you write me a strong letter of recommendation? Because a lukewarm letter will not um, you know, serve its purpose. You really want this person to know you personally, know some you know, biographical details, some hobbies, and then know you in like kind of in, in a professional or academic setting so that they know that you know you can be a professional and that you can put in the work and right. you know, step up to the occasion. Um, for your personal statement, my biggest tip is like, make it personal. Um, I can definitely talk more about this on my Instagram if you guys have questions about it. Um, I kind of struggled with it, but after I think the key is just make sure you do a lot of revisions. Do a lot of revisions and get a lot of eyes on it. You'll get a lot of ideas about how to change the wording, the structure of these paragraphs. Um, just make it like kind of hit home. And um, that's my biggest tip for the personal statement. Then again, you just gotta apply broadly. So I applied to 30 programs all across the country. And I'd suggest apply to where you, you could see yourself living. Um, so let's go ahead with some clinical cases. I pulled them from this textbook here, which is wonderful. Um, here is an Instagram page called The Radiologist. And he has these beautiful diagrams. So this is a chest x-ray. Um, and he has these beautiful diagrams. I'll have um, more of them uh, later in the 
in the slides. Um, but he just has all of the anatomy splayed out here. It's, yeah, he does a great job. So um, speaking of chest x-rays, let's jump into the first case. So I have five cases total for you guys. So we have a 65 year old female presenting with history of COPD, uh, has a fever. She is short of breath. She's producing some sputum, it's green in color. She has pleuritic chest pain. So when she takes a deep breath in, she, uh, it hurts for her. Let's see, how's it going? Oh, it's on the other side. <laughs> Couldn't see it there. Um, okay, so she's tachypnic, so she's breathing fast. She has tachycardia, her heart rate's fast. Crackles on physical exam with the stethoscope on the right side. So leukocytosis on her labs, meaning her white blood cells are elevated on her complete blood count. So thoughts so far, I'll just- so What do you guys think? Oh, someone said pneumonia. Perfect. Oh, is that it? Yep. Oh, so look we're looking at this right lower lobe opacity here. Mm -hmm. And the arrows are pointing at it. But as radiologists, we wouldn't have arrows. But this is just a class of pneumonia. So chest x-rays are used to diagnose pneumonia or can be used. So we put all of this clinical picture together to kind of understand what's going on. It's really cool. All right, so we have 58-year-old male. Arrows are pointing to something. So we have a positive arrow sign, we might sarcastically say. Um, there's a history of coronary artery disease, shortness of breath, orthopnea. So orthopnea means that you might be using a pillow or two pillows in bed at night um, because laying flat makes it more difficult for you to breathe. So upright helps. Respiratory rate is 30 per minute, fairly fast. He has rails on physical exam when we put a stethoscope to his lungs. So what do we think? So I'll just point one thing out. His heart is enlarged. He has what's called cardiomegaly. And having a big heart is a good thing in the non-medical world. <laughs> but, um, someone asked, I feel dumb for asking, but why is the right on the left? It's like, isn't it like inverted when you take a... Yes, so the, this is the patient's right side, and this mm -hmm. is the patient's left side, so the heart kind of sits on the left side. So it's just, it's just the orientation of how we view these images. Mm -hmm. Someone said congestive heart failure, pneumothorax. Those are the popular ones. Good. So one way we can describe these opacities is fluffy and bilateral. So they're on both sides instead of unilateral. They're also perihilar, so next to the hilum. And they have this kind of bat wing configuration, if you can imagine, or angel, angel wing. So yeah, we have pulmonary alveolar edema, secondary to congestive heart failure. So perfect, these are bread and butter cases. So in this one, we have a 30-year-old male, Oops. Mm -hmm. positive arrow sign, this patient presents with a gunshot wound, dyspnea. So we see a, a bullet here. Uh -huh. And this is actually behind the heart. And we oh. see this line here. So any thoughts in the chat? Someone may have already said it. Pneumothorax. Perfect. Collapsed lung. I'm so, so proud of you guys. Yeah. So we see the bullet. Good job, everyone. Yeah, that's great. You guys already know bread and butter stuff. So we saw an x-ray. A CT scan will give us way more information. So this is from that same page, the same radiologist, and he just has everything labeled again. So it's just, this is kind of to put this x-ray information into CT um, context. So here we have the stomach, the spleen, the diaphragm, the liver on the right side, right? Um, mm -hmm. The lungs have all these lobes here, right? We can see the trachea coming down and splitting into the bronchi. We can see the heart, of course. So we can also do 
ultrasound of the abdomen, look at the liver, the pancreas. Here we have a um, CT scan of the abdomen. All the anatomy is laid out nicely here for us. These are the psoas muscles. You see the spine here and the bladder. Um, we'll just continue blasting through these. So abdominal CT with more anatomy. You can see the kidneys here. Here's an abdominal MRI for comparison. So we go back, CTs and MRIs look a little different. Mm -hmm. They both give us a lot of information. This is a pelvic MRI, so is a prostate gland. We have a knee x-ray here. So patella here, tibia, femur, fibula. It's so nice that it's all labeled. Yeah, it's really, I mean, we wouldn't have this right if we're practicing but so you need to have this all in your mind um, right i mean like just for our purposes that's absolutely yeah i mean you can see a fracture on an x-ray you can see a dislocation mm -hmm. osteochondroma um and then here's a brain mri so again the anatomy just labeled nicely for us for whoever's interested in kind of more neuro stuff um you know we have the pons here the doula all right, so two more cases. These ones will be fairly fast. So 40 year old female. We have some arrows here on these brain MRs. Blur revision for two weeks. So keep this age range and this um, gender demographic in mind. Difficulty walking. So we have periventricular, globular foci. So mm -hmm. this is from multiple sclerosis. So basically you, ha you have these, um, these plaques that we can see on imaging. So MS is very common and it's an unfortunate diagnosis, but. So here we have a 45 year old male, history of head trauma. Maybe able to see this here. So this is lenticular shaped or a lens shaped. It's hyper intense lesion. This is a CT scan. Mm -hmm. In the left frontal region, here we see a fracture of that frontal bone. And this would be an epidural hematoma. So what about AI? So I think Dr. Cellini has a great YouTube video on this topic. This is a funny cartoon about the liability, um, like who takes liability if AI takes over. Mm -hmm. And long story short, this is, this is some basics about AI and deep learning and machine learning, what, what are the differences? So it's, it's a huge field of research. Um, it's already here with computer-aided diagnosis and mammography, for example. Um, mm -hmm. People will tell you it's not that great. Um, some say it'll replace radiologists, but really it's going to supplement us and make us better at um, you know, patient treatment, diagnosis, and ultimately improve patient outcomes. Mm -hmm. so, so my parting words for you guys is, you know, there's many paths to becoming a physician. You can take no years off, two years off, 20 years off, it doesn't matter. Um, and many different, you know, geographical paths. So I went to Florida, then back to California, then to Minnesota. So who knows where next? Um, overall, the exams I'd say are stressful, um, but overall, you know, what you're learning is very enjoyable. At least it was for me. So uh, it's very expensive, but you know, it's, it's financially a low risk investment and it's really an investment in your mind. It's an investment in yourself. So mm -hmm. I think it's worth it, but this is a deterrent for many people. And, um, I don't think it necessarily needs to be, um, for, depending on the rotation that you're on, the hours can be long and erratic. So you could be working a lot or you could be working, let's say 50 hours a week and the hours are just night shifts and they just, you know, they're erratic. So, um, so in my eyes, you know, after all of this, I think radiology really is the best kept secret in medicine. And mm -hmm. some people will tell you otherwise and have the reasons, uh, you know, just mm -hmm. for sake. Um, but yeah, also just, you know, make sure you keep up your hobbies, keep in touch with your loved ones. Call your parents, significant other, make sure you maintain your relationships with your friends, boyfriend, girlfriend, whoever. Um, just keep in touch with people because people want to know what you're up to. Uh, I think as med students, we have a, and residents, we have a very unique kind of life uh, perspective. And every month we're doing something different. We're on a different specialty. Mm -hmm. um, so it's great. But don't, um, don't forget about your loved ones. And those hobbies will help you, help round you out as well. And that's all I have for you guys.
That's amazing. Thank you so much. That was, I loved the, um, the questions where you asked us what we thought it was like really engaging. So thank you so much for um, doing the case study and presenting so many um, facts and advice for all of us, really. We all appreciate it so much. Um, for you guys, if you guys have any unanswered questions, I'm so sorry that I didn't get to ask a lot of our time. Um, unfortunately, we only have an hour, but if you guys have any questions um, or if you guys want to learn more about what um, Nick is up to, you guys can go to his Instagram. Make sure you guys follow him. I'll actually drop the handle in the chat. Um, again, thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, good luck, guys. I know it's, it's very stressful. I remember being there. Yeah. <laughs> If you have oh, yeah. any question on any part of this this crazy process that we call medical training, just shoot me a message and I'll get back to you. If not within a day, then definitely a couple of days. Thank you so much again. Remember, you guys, to subscribe if you guys want to keep getting notifications for when we go live. So that's like a super useful tool. And I will see you guys 